I'm happy to see those of you who have come tonight to listen to God's Word again. May I see the hands of those of you who were with us last night? May I see your hands? Oh, I am very touched and pleased and impressed with your faithfulness. I hope to see the same hands plus some more at our next session tomorrow night. Thank you very much for coming. Our subject for this evening is In His Image. In His Image. Of course, you will remember that last night's message was Living the Good Life. Now, every one of the presentations in this series will touch on the law of God. As Seventh-day Adventists, we ought to understand the critical role of the law in the plan of salvation. We're told in Great Controversy, page 478, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes these words, It is only as the law is restored to its rightful position that there can be a revival of primitive faith and godliness among his professed followers. It is only as the law of God is restored to its rightful position. And the reason why we have so many problems in the world today is because God's law has been trampled. And so we want to reestablish the law of God, not as an instrument of salvation, but as a standard of righteousness, as a standard of holy living, the standard required of angels, the standard required of Christ when he was on this earth, and it is the standard required of us today. In the book, Faith and Works, page 96, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes these words, the reason why there are so many spurious conversions in these days, and the word spurious means false, is that there is so low an appreciation of the law of God. And so every presentation will touch on the law of God in a different way. For tonight, we, I'll ask you to do two favors for me as I did last night. Favor number one, while I'm speaking, I'd like you to pray for me. And all I'd like you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number two, I would like you to think. It's essential that you think of what you're hearing. I need not ask you for reverence. You gave that last night. You'll give it tonight because you are aware that we are in the presence of a holy God whom we're worshiping. Let's bow our heads now and pray. Our loving Father in heaven, I ask in the name of Jesus to come very close to us now as we worship you through the spoken word. Father, without the aid of your spirit, we will drift into error. Because according to Christ in John 16, 13, howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Send your spirit, dear God, to guide us into truth. Take possession of my mind and speak through me that your people may be blessed, but even more, that your name may be glorified. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject for tonight, in his image. I'll put something on the screen that I want you to observe very carefully. And what I'm about to put are simply qualities of God's character. In other words, God has many qualities. We will just put some. God is love. God is holy. God is just. God is good. God is spiritual. God is righteous. God is right. God is perfect. God is eternal. God is truth and much more. Now let's look at this list of qualities. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. It is not enough to say that God is loving, which he is. God is love. The Bible does not present God as God is mercy. It presents him as merciful. The Bible does not say God is forgiveness. It says God is forgiving. But the Bible says that God is love. Love is God. And God is love. It is his fundamental quality from which everything else is expressed. In other words, mercy is an expression of love. Forgiveness is an expression of love. Graciousness, long-suffering, patience, they are all expressions of love, including justice. God is holy. 
1 Peter 1 15, he is just, he is good. Psalm 100 verse 5 says, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. He is spiritual. John 4 24, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He is righteous, Psalm eleven seven. the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. And we must try, we must desire, we must covet in a good way that which God loves. And if God loves righteousness, we should desire righteousness. God is right, he's always right. Deuteronomy 32 verse four, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Uh, Psalm 145 verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Meaning, whatever God does is right. Somebody say amen. amen. Even when he punishes us, he is right. Always remember that. God is always right. It is we who are almost always wrong. God is always right. He is perfect. Matthew 5 48, Be therefore perfect even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. God is true. He is truth. A God of truth and without iniquity. God is truth. Christ is truth. God is truth. So these are qualities of God. He is love. He is holy. He is just. He is good. He is spiritual. He is righteous. He is right. He is perfect. He's eternal. He's true or truth. Now, keeping your eye on this list, I want you to listen to a very familiar passage of Scripture. And it goes like this. And God said, let us make man in our image. Somebody say amen. amen. Let us make man in our image. How long has God had this image? Forever. God has always been God. This is not an improvement over time. God does not improve with time like wine. This is the way God has always been. Now God says, let us make man in our image so that mankind would be love, would be holy, just, good, spiritual, righteous, right, perfect, eternal, true, all these things, eternal in the sense that it was God's will that humanity live for how long? Forever. That's why he offers us eternal life. And God said, let us make man in our image. Now, God has no other desire for you and for me than that we live like that. I want you to grasp the tremendous privilege it is to have God set such a high standard for you and for me. Those of you who parents, you've sent your children to school, you pay exorbitant fees for their education. You have high standards for them. You want them to bring back home at the end of every term a sparkling, a spectacular grade report. All A's. So you can boast to the neighbors that your children are at the top of the class and you can put a sticker on the bumper of your car, I have a child in the honors class. Why should God be any different? God's desire for us, his standard for us is so high, it is based on his character himself, not the character of Gabriel, the highest angel. Are you listening to me? The character of God himself is the standard for humanity. Now, there, they may appear on the surface erroneously to be a difficulty with what I just said. How can a God, God, expect human beings to be like him? God does not require that you and I be God. He requires that we be godly. 
Education, page 18, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, Higher than the highest human thoughts can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, godlikeness is the goal to be reached. This is your goal and mine. And that should precede every other ambition. Whether it's to have a husband, a wife, children, a home, a career, this should come before every other human ambition. Because it is on the basis of this that anyone can be admitted into God's kingdom. And so God said, Genesis 1.26, let us make man, finish it for me, in our image. So this, what we're looking at, is the image of God. It's not complete, but you get the idea. This is the image of God. Anyone in God's image will look like that. The purpose of conversion is to bring us to that. Are you with me? It does not happen overnight, but we must have the decision in our hearts. A decision that is 100%, this is how I want to live. And since the Bible teaches everything comes out of the heart, if that decision is in your heart, 100%, it will come out in your life. We go to another slide. The same. But as you look at this list of qualities, I want you to think of, there's a scientific rule or law, and I will not express it scientifically. It says if A is equal to B, and B is equal to C, then A is equal to C. There's a more formal and impressive way to state that. I don't recall it at the moment. Let me say it again. If I look like him, and he looks like him, then I look like him. Are you with me? All right, now, we said this is the image of God, and we were right. I want you to look at something else. Now, here are the same qualities. But what are we looking at now? The law of God. God's law is love. Romans 13, 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, for love is the fulfilling of the law. Are you with me? The law of God is holy. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. The law of God is just. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. The law is good. Romans chapter 7, verse 12. You can make the corrections. The law is spiritual. Romans chapter 7, verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law is righteous. Psalm 119, verse 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. The law of God is right, Psalm 19, verse 8. The law of God is uh, perfect, Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. The law of God is eternal, Psalm 11, 111, uh, reading verse 7 and 8. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever. So God's law is eternal. God's law is true. Psalm 119, verse 151, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. What we're seeing is that this image is identical to God's law. Now, follow me closely as I put back the law of God. When God said, follow me closely, let us make man in our image. Anyone in the image of God is in the image of the law. I saw a few heads nodding. And I'm grateful for that, but not enough of you were nodding. Perhaps what I said went right over your heads. Let me try it again. Let me give you a quotation. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings for Blessing, page 54, paragraph 1. Listen carefully to the words of inspiration. 
The law of God is as holy as God himself. As holy as he is, as perfect as he is. The law presents to men the righteousness of God. Let me say it again. The image of God, which is this, is no different from the image found in the law of God. That is why those who claim to follow Christ, the correctness or legitimacy of their claim will be tested by the law of God. It is the standard by which God measures character. Great Controversy, page 268, paragraph 2, Ella White writes, The written word, the law of God. Remember last night I told you the Bible sometimes referred to the word as commandment. Ella White writes, the written word, and then she says, the law of God will measure the character of every man and condemn all whom this inerrant test declares to be short. In other words, anyone falling short is determined by the law. Anyone coming up to God's standard is determined by the law. Because the law is a precise, identical reflection of the character, the righteousness, the holiness, and the perfection of God. Now, what's our subject? In his image. Now, Satan knows that better than anyone else. Ellen White tells us in The Faith I Live By, page 66, paragraph 2, speaking of Lucifer, she writes, God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself. When Lucifer was made, he was as close to being God as any created being ever was. God made him good and beautiful, as near as possible like himself. So Lucifer understood the relationship between God and God's law, how the law is a perfect reflection of the very character of God. No wonder it is Lucifer's priority to overthrow God's law. And so we read in Great Controversy, page 582, paragraph 1, from the very beginning of the Great Controversy in heaven, it has been Satan's purpose to overthrow the law of God. It was to accomplish this purpose that he entered upon his rebellion against the Creator. And though he was cast out of heaven, he has continued the same warfare on this earth. Because by blinding our eyes to the law, he blinds our eyes to the character of God. Let me say again, the Bible says, and God said, let us make man in our image. We have discovered tonight, the image of God is no different from the image the law reflects because it is the same thing. Let me put it the way I put it earlier, anyone reflecting the image of God is reflecting God's law. Let me introduce something else to your consciousness. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let's take a look at what the glory of God is. Go to uh, Exodus chapter 33, we shall read from verse 18. Exodus 33, reading from verse 18, our subject is in his image. I hope you all have your Bibles with you. And if you don't have, please read with the person next to you. Hopefully the person has these qualities and will not mind if you read with him or her. Exodus 33, reading from verse 18, the Bible says, this is Moses speaking, and he said, I beseech thee, show me what? Thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. Exodus 33, 18 to 20. Now we skip to chapter 34. We shall begin reading at verse 5. Remember the request that Moses made, Show me thy glory. We tend to think of glory as just light. The Bible says in the, uh, Exodus 34, verse 5, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed what? 
the name of the Lord, what did Moses ask to see? The glory of God, what did God say? I will show you my name. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and to the third and the fourth and the children's children and to the fourth and to the, the third and the fourth generation. Now God was telling Moses, I am merciful, I am gracious. I am abundant in goodness and truth. This has nothing to do with light, which is what we think of when you think of glory. God is showing Moses his character. Now, sometimes glory refers to light, but first and foremost, God's glory is his character because the light comes from the fact that he is what he is. When Adam and Eve were sinless, they also had a garment of light. So the character comes first. It is on the basis of character we have light. The moment they sinned, the light vanished. So glory is not first light. Glory is character. God's amazing grace, page 322, paragraph 2, Ellen White writes, God's glory is his character. Let's get some biblical evidence of that point. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let's read verse 18. Let's go there quickly. Because time flies so fast. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading verse 18. Do you have that? If you do, say amen. amen. The Bible says, but we all, with open face, beholding us in the glass, what? The glory of God are changed, what? Into the same image from glory unto glory, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now look at that verse carefully again. There are two words that are used interchangeably. Can you guess what the two words are? Image and glory. Listen to the verse. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, what? The glory of whom? Of the Lord. Are changed into what? The same. Now for the writer to say the same image, he must have said something before that means image for him to say the same image. What he meant by glory is image. Now, Ella White refers to glory to glory as character to character. Jesus prayed in John 17, 22, and the glory which thou givest me, I have given them, referring to the fact that by his teachings, he was developing in the disciples his own character. The glory which thou givest me, I have given them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, Paul says, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the truth and the Spirit. Then he says in verse 4, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through the gospel we obtain the glory, not light, but light character character is glory and so when moses says show me your glory he probably meant brightness god showed him his character now listen to romans 3 23 all have sinned and come short of the glory of god now how could we say that differently and still be correct say it with me now and please don't disappoint me all have sinned and come short of the character Because glory is character. This is the character of God. Now the only way to come short of God's character is to sin, to break that. Are you with me? Let me say it again. This is God's glory. The Bible says there is a way by which mankind come short. In other words, do not live up to this. There is only one way to come short of the glory of God, the character of God, and that is by offending the law.
And the only way to live up to the glory of God, which is the character of God, is by keeping the law through Christ. This law that Satan has tried with great success to annihilate, and I put annihilate in quotation marks because no one can destroy the law of God. What I meant was he has succeeded in blinding our eyes or the eyes of many to the role of God's law in the old plan of salvation. Let me say it again. Repetition is an effective tool of teaching. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not the glory of the law, because the glory of the law is God's glory. Are you with me? The only way to offend God is to break the law. The only way to please God is to live by His law. Because the law, according to Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, 14, represents the whole duty of man. Everything God requires of you and of me is somehow expressed in his law, whether we see it or not, because the Bible says the commandment is exceeding broad. When Christ, speaking for his father, stood on Mount Sinai in Exodus 20 and said, Thou shalt not kill, which of the Israelites understood that he also included anger as a form of murder? until thousands of years later, or almost 2,000 years later, he came on the, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause. The commandment, thou shalt not kill, has always included unreasonable anger. Fornication, adultery, have always included lusting. The law is deep. The law is broad, and the more we look into the law, and I'll deal with that before this series ends, the more we see how the law is all-encompassing. The only way to offend God is to break His law. The only way to please God is to live by that law. He has no other standard for you or for angels. Let me say that again. You know, God has one standard in the universe. That's his character. And that character is expressed in his law. So that through the law, God provides a way for us to understand what it means to move more and more in the direction of his character. Satan has come up with a master stroke. He has gotten into preachers, some of them in the Adventist church, to disregard, devalue, undermine, denigrate the law of God. And so there are preachers who say God's law has been done away with. You might as well do away with God as to do away with his law. And there are those among us who say that God's law is, should not be stressed because to stress God's law is to promote legalism. When the rich young ruler came to Christ in Luke 18 and said, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus told him, thou knowest the commandments? Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father, thy mother. He did not need to quote all ten. He was clearly referring to his commandments. But that kind of standard is not possible for an unconverted person. Are you with me? We are born the very opposite of this. Makes no difference how many degrees you have from the university of wherever. What's this town called? University of Langley. It makes no difference. <laughs> Only the process and power of conversion can make this possible. That's why you cannot keep the law to be saved. 
you have to be saved first. Because Paul says in Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Well, how do I keep it? That's why conversion is the process by which God, through our faith in his son's atonement, brings us into harmony with this and then provides the power to keep us in harmony with it. The power that brings us into harmony is the same power that keeps us in harmony with this standard, which is the standard for the entire universe. All have sinned and come short of God's character. I say again, the only way to offend God the only way to offend God is to offend his law. And the only way to please God, since the Bible is a book of opposites, you just flip that. If offending God is offending his law, then pleasing God must be keeping his law. In his image is our subject for this evening. I want you to listen again to God's words. And God said, let us make man in our image. And the image that is found in the law of God is the very image of God. Anyone reflecting God's image is doing so because the person is reflecting what is in the law. And so Jesus said, think not, I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. In Christ's triumphant, page 339, paragraph 2, Ellen White writes these words, Christ came to represent the character of the Father that is represented in his holy law, for the law is the transcript of his character. Then she closes by saying these remarkable words, Christ was both the law and the gospel. Christ was the law and the gospel. Let me put it this way. Listen carefully. Someone built this church using what? Architectural plans, am I right? Drawings. Now, everything had to be on there in order for the drawings to be, I guess, approved by whomever approves these things. An architect or a draftsman, whoever draws these things, can look at an architectural plan on a flat piece of paper and see walls. Are you listening to me? See where every outlet goes, every plug, every pipe, every heating system. He looks and he sees it. I look, I see lines. The law of God is that architectural plan with all the details. Jesus Christ is the building. There is no difference between the architectural plan and what goes up. Now, through Christ, we become buildings based on the same architectural plan. My brothers and sisters, God's law has been trampled. And one of the reasons why this church was raised up was to lift up God's law to a world that has turned its back on God's holy law and the world is suffering the consequences. Because for disobedience, the Bible has promised cursings. And for obedience, God has promised blessings. And we live in a cursed world because God's law has been disregarded. And there must be a voice. And the people charged to lift up that voice are Seventh-day Adventists. To let the world know God has a law, not serving as an instrument of salvation, but as a standard of righteousness that he has for this world, for this universe, for unfallen worlds where people have never sinned. The standard is the same. And so tonight, I ask you the question, are you in God's image? 
Let me introduce something else if my little thing will work. I want to go to another slide. It's not moving, so someone help me perhaps upstairs to move this. I want you to see, now here's another image. Hmm? You see that image? Anything on there familiar to you? It's all familiar to me. This all comes from Galatians 5, 19 to 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, and cleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, strife, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings. And the verse goes on to say, and such like, meaning the list is virtually endless. But Paul didn't want to take all the time to give an exhaustive list. He gives some. This is the image of sin. This is the image of righteousness. The only way to develop that image is to offend this. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Yeah. That is the result of offending that. Now, Lucifer's ploy, not Lucifer, Satan's ploy, remove this and you necessarily remove that. Because there's no way to measure that. Now, remove this and you also remove this. You see how central the law is? It is by the law we know sin, that takes us to hell. It's by the law we know righteousness, righteousness takes us to the kingdom. Whether it's heaven or hell, the law. Not as an instrument of salvation, as a standard by which God determines who goes this way or who goes that way. And so we go back to this ugly image. Now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these. This can only result if the law is disregarded. Because by the law is the knowledge of sin. The Bible says of Jesus Christ in Matthew 1 21, the angel speaking to Joseph in a dream, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from this. Now, the Bible, as I said, is a book of opposites. If Christ saves you from something, he's got to save you to something. He saves us from this to that. And so tonight, I pray that God's Holy Spirit is working on hearts, mine and yours. Very often, people take a casual approach to church and religion. You do it so often. Every Sabbath you're in church, two hours you go home and that's it. Never see you again. And th these things become habits. Not conscious expressions of a living, vibrant, bubbling, bustling relationship with God. They become just habits. Autopilot. And we fail to realize that to live in God's image means constantly moving upward in godliness. And that cannot be put on autopilot. It has to be a deliberate purposeful, intentional way of life. Every day by the abiding power of Jesus Christ, I want to be more and more like God. In His image. To be in God's image, the law in its completeness has to be expressed in our lives. What do I mean by that? I told you last night, there is no such thing as statistical salvation. You cannot tell God I kept nine. 90% is virtually 100. It does not work. God is a God for whom it's all or nothing. 
when it comes to salvation. So Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me. It's not he that is not with me is thinking about it. You either this or you're that. There is no middle ground. Question for you, don't answer me. Which one are you? I did not ask you how many offices you hold in the church. I did not ask how long you've been in the church. I did not ask how many generations back you had preachers in the family. My question for you as an individual, no one is saved by a group or by family, it's individual. Are you this or are you that? Am I this or am I that? What is my relationship to God's law? My relationship to God's law is my relationship to God. God's Amazing Grace, page 20, paragraph 5. In the new birth, the heart is brought into harmony with God as it is brought into accord with His great law. Meaning, as I said last night, the only way to be right with God is to be right with His law. Because the question has to be asked, how do you know you're right with God? It is not enough to say, I am right, because Jesus says, most people serve me with their lips. It's not enough to say it. Jesus Christ did not say in John 14, 15, if ye love me, tell me. Which is the way most of us serve God. We tell him. He is sick to death of being told he wants to be shown if he love me, keep my command. All of them. Through the power of Christ. On this earth, this was the life of Christ. He came to save us from this and that list is not complete and so tonight for the final time I appeal to you from my heart and I appeal to myself by what image are we living there are only two not the image of God and the image of Adam is the image of God and the image of Satan sin did not originate with Adam when Adam sinned and he developed a sinful nature, that sinful nature had already originated in Satan. So Jesus told the scribes and Pharisees in John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil. Not Adam. 1 John 3, verse 8, he that committed sin is of the devil. Yes, we're from Adam, but sin goes beyond Adam. Ultimately, a sinner is a child of Satan. And the mind of a sinner is the mind of Satan. The only difference is it is more intense in Satan. But it's the same. So your choice and mine, the image of God, which is, the, which is uh, no, not that at all. The image of God, which is this. Or the image of Satan, which is that. Only you and God can decide which it is. And by you and God, what I mean is God decides and you agree. But tonight, you and I can leave this place with a conscious unilateral decision. What do I mean by unilateral? It has nothing to do with your husband or your boyfriend or your wife. When God made Adam, he did not make Adam and Eve at the same time. When he made Adam, Eve was not in existence. And when he made Eve, he had put Adam not in just a sleep, but a deep sleep. And sleep is a symbol of death. So to all practical purposes, when God made Eve, Adam was nowhere around. When God made Adam, Eve was nowhere around. He dealt with them individually. Then the second level is the family. Now I'm saying to you, make a unilateral decision. You decide. Like Joshua has for me and my house. Now his house included him, but Joshua wanted to identify himself as an individual in his family. And he said, as for me and my house, meaning if my house decided to leave God, 
I will follow God. You decide tonight, which image do you desire? This or that? I want that. I want that for you. Is that what you want for yourself? Can I see your right hand? Uh, God bless you, hands down, heads bowed as we pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you today, God, for your long suffering, your mercy, your graciousness. We've seen the central role of the law in the plan of salvation. It expresses your righteousness. It is as holy as you are holy. It is as perfect as you are perfect. The only way to get along with you today, God, is to conform with your law by the indwelling power of Jesus Christ. Now, Father, forgive us for the occasions when we fell short of your glory, which is your character. Forgive us, dear God, when we misrepresented you to the world. Tonight, we seek your forgiveness on the basis of the sinless life of Christ. Please, God, forgive us. And give us a desire for a godly life. A desire for a righteous life through constant connection with the righteous life of Jesus Christ. That in us, the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. Bless every man, every woman, boy and girl, every family. As we leave this place, dear God, let not secular discussion snatch this message from our minds. Let us leave reflecting on what we've heard. Bring us back tomorrow night with those whom we invite. We offer this prayer, dear God, from our hearts. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen and Amen.